This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, and Huskers Radio Network Analyst, Jeremiah Searles. And welcome back. Another victory episode of the Sideline Slice with Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cootie, and in studio today, and to celebrate the win, we got Vals here oh, with yeah. us. Victory it's, Vals, you I kidding mean, me? The studio smells like pizza. It's great. I mean, the pizza's fresh. Val's <laughs> pizza fresh is elite. So we got we got Val's. We got the dessert pizza too for a little treat afterwards. So yeah, we got pizza pizza at ten forty five on a Monday. Can't beat it. I uh, when I was talking with the people about bringing the pizza. Th- shout out Anthony by the way with Val's. But I said Jeremiah and I are big fans of the dessert pizza. Oh yeah. So we got a whole dessert pizza, the breadsticks. All I had never had their breadsticks. It's bomb. But yeah, we got to keep winning so we can do this every week. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I-, I love this. Last year, so after every win, me, Greg, and Ben would go sit in- and Nate would go sit in the radio booth and just wait for victory Val's. And we'd all sit there and we kind of start reminiscing about the game, talking about what happened and what we're going to talk about this week. And then we'd always be like, all right, pizza check. And it was always like kind of rotating of who had to go up and look. And they come back like, oh, pizza's not here yet. And just dang it. And then eventually he's like, pizza's here. And we'd all race in there to try and beat all the reporters in there so you could get it fresh. And yeah, I mean, anytime we can have more victory vowels, the better. Were you the lead blocker? On of the- course. Are you kidding me? I used to go like, <laughs> I used to go last year. I would go straight from radio show here, 90 minute pregame show with you on Facebook, call the game on the sideline. By the time I got up to that radio booth, I was ravenous for food. I would have at least six pieces. I mean, at minimum six pieces. And sometimes I'd even take like two or three for the walk back to the car. You just never know. I told the producers they're going to miss out because you're taking it back to the kiddos who are also fans of Val's. 100%. That Oliver and Aylin are going to hammer this for lunch. (laughs) All right. Well, let's get into it. Not pretty, but found a way to win, which we have not been able to say in recent years about this team. They found a way to come out on the right end of the scoreboard after Absolutely. this win. Absolutely, and, and you know, winning is hard. It's not an easy thing to do, and anytime you can find a way to win, and especially in a one-score game that has just been the thorn in the side of Nebraska football for the last four or five years, like that's always good. You know, close game, everyone at the end, I think even all the fans were even kind of like, are we going to be able to do this or what? I mean, and you saw the players hopefully finally be able to get over that mental block or whatever it is that holds them back of the the fear of failing instead of the wanting to go succeed. And I've said this before, winning games like that is a high that you chase. Yeah. Like you just as a player, like the feeling of winning a close game, especially on the road in an environment that was a tad bit more hostile than I think I might've given it credit for. Yeah. You know, winning a game like that on the road just does so much for the confidence of a player. And it just makes you want to just get that feeling that much more. And it's one thing to win one, but it's another thing to start stacking, right? I mean, we've talked about that a lot and, and Hey, just getting in the win column, but then to figure out a way to do it multiple times is absolutely massive massive yeah and it, you learn how to make good winning habits during the week right like you when you win one time you try and look back like okay what did I do last week let's emulate it and then you do it again you're like okay what did I have done the last two weeks and you start to kind of self-scout yourself as not just an individual player but as a offense as a defense from a team's perspective from a weight room perspective from a recovery perspective like you just can look at like what was the winning formula and let's just if it's not broke don't fix it just stay with it right and that's so much easier to do than every week when you lose you're like oh what can I do differently or how did I not prepare or how did I and you know that you start questioning all those things versus when you win you just start building confidence in what your rhythm is during the week and so for them to go into that and now going to another big road test against Purdue, a team that's playing really well. Like you want to see them carry all that stuff over from Indiana and Rutgers onto the field against Purdue next week. Before we dive in too far into the X's and O's, hand, let's hand out some more game balls. That was fun last yes, week. Let's do it again. Winners deserve game <laughs> balls. Winners deserve game balls. Number one, we got to go to our guy, big number 83 on the offense, Travis Vokalek, finding the end zone against his, his first old career touchdown as a Husker. And against his old squad. Like you knew he wanted that one. You knew and you could see the joy just on the dude's face. I mean, right here, right? Just right yeah. there. Just so happy when he scored that touchdown. And not just in the passing, but he was really good good in the run game too. Mm-hmm. He's playing at a very high level. Really good to get him back. Really excited that that little injury at the end of the game didn't keep him out. You know, seeing him come back in the game after that twisted ankle was huge. So big props to Big 83, big vocal like out there on the edge, game ball on offense. 
On defense, we got to give it to the superstar. We got to <laughs> give it to the WWE champion of the world, Garrett Nelson. I mean, the dude just exudes energy. Like, yes. you, if you're around him, I feel like I'd be exhausted just talking to him. Yes. You know, and so it's in, it's contagious, though. You see everyone else like kind of rallying around that, and mm. it's what you got to have when you're a leader like that. He had a sack. He had a career high in TFLs. I mean, he played a very solid game, and he showed up in a big moment when we needed him at the end in, in sacks, and so. Again, another guy building off momentum, building off two solid performances. So those two dudes stood out big time. There's a lot of other guys that played really well. You got to give a special shout out to Miles Farmer there. Has in the game ceiling interception there at the end. And Actually, playing. it was Malcolm Hartsog. Malcolm but, Hartsog. But, 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 uh, 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 who, uh, Farmer had the one that set up to the touchdown, correct. the go-ahead touchdown. There it is. Yeah, yeah. There so it is. he had the one that was the go-ahead touchdown. I mean, so all those guys on the back end played a lot better this week. They're going to be tested again this week, so like to see that. But, you know, those two guys, Volkolek, Garrett Nelson, really showed out last week, and they get the game balls. Volkolek ankle, he seemed to be fine. And, you know, for those of you that have had a sprained ankle, it, it hurts. It doesn't – it just kind of lingers. And you and I have both had ACLs. I think that – a bad turned ankle hurts worse than the initial tear of the ACL. 100%. So it's like it just stings really bad, but you can walk it off and get back out there. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah, when I tore my ACL, I stood up and tried to play another play. Cause I, thought, I was like, oh, my knee just popped. Like, that was weird. <laughs> and then I planted on it, and some dude just crumpled me. I was like, okay, something's wrong. But, yeah, you turn an ankle. I mean, look at um, – Mac Jones for the Patriots two weeks ago. Dude was like basically writhing and crying in pain. And he had a high ankle. Yeah. You know, I mean, high ankles are one of the most painful and lingering yeah. injuries that you can have. Like when you have a high ankle, you're not going to feel right until the season's over. Like it, there's just no recovery time. And it could be tweaked every game. But again, yep. you just go back in there, you get retaped, you walk it off, and then you get back out there. That's the good thing about an ankle is, yes, it, it hurts initially and you might be having to run off, but mm -hmm. you can easily get back out oh, there. Yeah, and there's always ibuprofen and Tylenol. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, and then Garrett Nelson, again, 11, a career high, 11 tackles. And yeah, just the way that he was as a vocal leader too. And because I thought at times when the defense was not playing well, he kind of, um, I, I think he's probably just upset and disappointed in the way they were playing, but he, I don't want to say disappeared, but he was not as much of a leader as you would expect. But I think Mickey Joseph has talked to him about being that leader and boy, he's up and down the sideline. He's talking to the offense. He's talking to the defense. And um, yeah, he was, um, he was definitely a ball of energy on Saturday. You, you got to have that Friday. on defense. Yeah, Friday. <laughs> you you got to have that on defense. You know, you got to have the energy guy. You got to have the dude that can bring everyone together and rally around. And at the same time, if you're going to be that guy, you have to hold yourself to a higher standard on the field. If you're out there and you're not performing well and you're on the sideline running around up and down, I'll tell you firsthand, like, you kind of get written off. You know, like, if you're not performing on the field, it's kind of like shut up and get out of my face. Like, you know, it's just a natural thing to do as a player where it's like, if you really are going to be a rah-rah vocal leader guy, you have to hold yourself to a higher standard when you play. And he's doing that, you know, so that's a great thing. But I think it also it pushes everyone to follow along. When you have that vocal guy that's pushing the, pushing the envelope of the play, everyone wants to ride that. You know, and it's kind of the same thing with the sacks. You know, sacks are like hitting percentages. When you start getting a teammate that's getting a lot of sacks, everyone wants to be involved in that everyone wants to be at the party at the quarterback you know so that's a good thing to see him get going here as we enter into the teeth of big 10 here because we got to keep affecting the quarterback's play i did want to go back to the travis vocal like touchdown because it was really funny there was a funny moment that was happening between chancellor brewington and chris hickman and travis and you know travis has been a big part of this team for a few years now but that was his first touchdown and so he told me the story after the game that they had been giving him a hard time that you know they'd been leading him in touchdowns because chancellor or Brewington has gotten in the end zone, so is Chris Hickman. So he's like, they've been joking and, and kind of give him a little hard, bit of a hard time. Like, hey, yo, we're leading you in touchdowns. I mean, you're the leader of this room, but we have more touchdowns than you. That's funny. You know, if he stays healthy, I think he could lead this team in touchdowns. And I'm very serious. I mean, he is such a red zone threat. And you talked about it last year with the emergence of Austin Allen in the back half of the year. You know, if Casey can start getting comfortable with Travis in that red zone area specifically, he can really become a favorite target. I mean, you saw in Northwestern he was getting plugged all over, and you're starting to see him start to develop that chemistry back with Casey. So if they can continue to stay healthy, both those guys can make a really special connection. All right, we'll dive into the offense a little bit more, but we always like to start with the positives here. So, uh, I mean, the defense, after that first drive, boy, they locked in. They held Rutgers to field goals. They got the sacks. They got the takeaways. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did everything that you needed them to do to win that football game. Yeah, you know, they played a really good bend, don't break defense. You know, I think that they were able to keep everything in front of them, which was big. Um, I mean, shout out to those refs. A lot of OPIs that I, 
I, I tweeted in the middle of halftime. I was like, ref, open your eyes because <laughs> both sides were terrible, you know. But I think that we rolled with some adversity too. You know, some of those calls that didn't go our way, and it, we could have found ways to tank and, and let them kind of get momentum. But I thought that we did a really nice job of standing up, getting off the field on third down was something that we talked about and that they did. So, yeah, you know, that defense locks in. Anytime you can hold a team to 13 points, I mean, that's, that's hard to do in any league. I don't care if it's the Big Ten. I don't care if it's the Big 12. You know, whatever it is, you know, you hold that you hold a team to a, a two touchdown game. Essentially, that's a huge hats off to everyone involved and especially Bill Bush. You know, I think Bill Bush has done a really nice job and I'm still waiting. I need one more game before I can start really comparing what's the difference between Bill Bush's defense and everyone else's defense. You know, I've gotten a lot of people that have asked me, like, what's different in the scheme? I don't have a great answer yet. It's something I'm going to look into more this week and start kind of looking, is it different coverage? Is it different schemes? You know, because right now, it, there's definitely a difference. But I also think a lot of it is just that players are winning their one-on-one -on -one matchups more than they were at the beginning part of the season. I think, and this has been something that I talked to Ty Robinson last week about and a couple of the players that after games, and you, you just have to take into thought about that there is a lot of new pieces that are figuring out how to play together and you know just with the transfers and then players and you brought this up on the podcast that when you're in a lot of close games it's good but it also doesn't give you a chance to develop some of those younger players so some of these younger players are getting their first time you know thrown to the fire in actual game like action which is just so different and so you know Luke Reimer brought it up a lot of them brought it up that it's just it was a work in progress for us to play games together and we're finally starting to click on all three phases of the defense and, and figuring out how to play together too. Yeah and then I mean you add on top of that a, a D coordinator change midway through the first part of the season you know I thought that everyone's responded really well to that you know I was concerned of how like I think Bill Bush can't come in and he's done a great job not just changing everything right you can't do that mid-season I tell all the time football teams don't get fixed in October and November they get fixed and reworked in January February you know so like seeing Bill Bush come in and just make minor tweaks to things that he saw that maybe we were trying to do that we weren't excelling at or things that we were excelling at and not doing enough I think has been a really good job by him and he's calling a really clean game on the defensive side of the ball also and you know I wasn't on the sideline for every game last year but I've seen more it seems like there's more communication going on as far as making adjustments in game between Barrett Rude Mike Dawson Bill Bush they're all they and you know Travis Fisher they kind of huddle up and talk about what they're seeing and then they go talk about their guys so I think they're also tweaking as they go if that makes sense yeah and which you have to do you know the third quarter has kind of been a nemesis for Nebraska we come out, I think last year we were outscored almost double in the third quarter last year. And so making those in-game adjustments and having the ability to make the adjustments on the whiteboard, but then carrying it over with no practice and nothing, just saying, hey, here's what we're doing, and then carrying it over when the real bullets are flying, speaks a lot to the growth of this defense, I mean, from the player's perspective. So that's been really good to see, and that's something we're going to have to continue to do as we... Excuse me, as we make a run down the stretch here. You're taking bites. As we, I am. When I, mean, I come on camera, you take yeah, a big you, bite. You gotta just... <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the offense. And, boy, just not good in the first half. And Mickey Joseph was not shy about telling me that at halftime. we got to start making plays. Like, the defense is playing lights out. The offense has got to be better. And so, um, made, scored when they needed to. But, I mean, got to figure out a way to generate some more points. And which is crazy because, again, it was an offense that uh, was scoring really at will uh, to start the season. We got to protect the quarterback. Yeah. I mean, we have weapons on the outside. I mean, you talk about Washington and Palmer and Vokalek and Alante Brown and, I mean, Omar Man. You, you get the list goes on of weapons that we have at our disposal. But I even think, I think Colin Miller even tweeted, he was like, I don't care how many weapons we have if we don't have time to throw it to him. And that's the problem we're having right now. And I love all these O linemen. I just saw Bryce Benhart out there um, as I was pulling in today. You know, I love all these guys, but I think they all know they have to play better. You know, this is a this is a physical league. The Big Ten is known for its physicality. It's knowing for having first, second round draft picks on the D linemen that can get after the quarterback. And you know, we're going to continue to get challenged up front until we stop it. You know, I think Rutgers blitzed us a lot. They put us in one on one situations where they're not only rushing four, but they're rushing five, so that everyone's got a one on one matchup, and they're just betting that one of their guys is going to win over one of our guys. You know, and so those are things that really have to get cleaned up because when Casey has time to throw, there is guys open. Yes. You know, and, and big this, things happen. Yes, and there is big opportunities to push the ball down the field in this offense, you know. But I think Whipple and company have started trying to find ways that they got to dial it back a little bit. They can't push the ball down the field because the ball's got to come out sooner, you know. The slant.
slants, the hitches, the curls versus the big deep overs or the go routes. You know, we have to adjust because, like I said, you can't fix it in October. You can play better, and I think that this group will continue to play better as the pieces that are getting mixed and matched are starting to gel a little bit more. But, I mean, you're seeing everyone's getting a shot. Bryce Benhart started the game. Hunter Anthony came into the game. I saw Henley Lutovsky out there. I've seen Ethan Piper. You know, the only two guys that I think played every single snap were Turner Corcoran and Trent Hickson. You know, so they're still trying to figure out what the secret sauce is up front, which is scary to think about in October. But it's the nature of the reality of where we're at at the position. Um, because when you have a back like Grant, you want to pound with, but you've got to open holes for, and you have weapons like Casey, like all the pieces are there. We've just got to really start clicking with that front five to make this thing go. Valentino's has been a Nebraska tradition since 1957. Get the big red double jumbo deal. Two one-topping jumbo pizzas for only $18.29 each. Okay, so going into the offensive line, we'll get it in the weeds here a little bit. Just take us through what, how do you win those one-on-one -on -one matches? Is it all like mm -hmm. personal mentality? want to or what goes into maybe starting to win those one-on-one -on -one battles i mean a lot of offensive line play is confidence and i mean that like you have to be able to snap when you call the huddle or when you break the huddle or where you, we don't huddle when you're standing at the line of scrimmage and you get the play you have to be able to sit there and look the guy across from you in the eye and be like i'm gonna whip your ass like that that's it's, it's literally that simple like you have to have that mentality the second there's a shed of doubt in your mind of like i don't know he's fast he's this like when you start thinking you think you stink like you can't think at offensive line you have to have a confidence so many times offensive linemen especially young offensive linemen i talk to them a lot you know as even in college as in some young offensive in the nfl like you almost think i have to stop what he's doing you know the mentality has to get flipped he has to stop what i'm doing right he has to get past me i'm going to take my set i'm going to use the right technique i'm going to use the right angles and i'm going to get to my spot and i'm going to fight him like it's going to be a fist fight and it might not always be pretty but you know what two and a half seconds is not a long time fight that dude for two and a half seconds and in the run game you have to have the mentality like i want to hurt this dude across from me you do you have to be like you know if i throw you in the dirt and you break something that's not my fault don't get thrown in the dirt <laughs> you know that's just the mentality you have to have and you can turn it on and off and i was a guy that could turn it on and off but some guys you just kind of have to keep poking them until they get to that point because offensive line is a mean and nasty and dirty position you got to be a prick you have to be a prick you can't care about anyone else in front of you that's in a different color and i need more out of that of these guys because i think they're capable of it in fact i know they're capable i've seen it out of them but i need to see just more prick and just get after these dudes in front of them yeah and you said it i mean just give casey a little bit of time and those wide receivers are i mean i think it's safe to say Trey Palmer is an elite wide receiver. Yes. He is making a case for being one of the top wide receivers in college football. Yeah, and, and the other thing, too, is if you get your quarterback hit or sacked, pick him up. <laughs> I don't know why. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. NFL, high school, college. If you get your quarterback sacked, go get his butt off the ground and say, my bad. And then don't let it happen again. You know, take a pride in that. Of like, You will not touch him again. You touch him again, like I'm going to hurt you. Like That's just where you have to be. And I think that... A lot of it is technique driven, you know, cleaning up your technique, trusting your technique. So many times, especially young old linemen, get out there and when the real bullets start flying, you kind of go haywire and you start trying to do something that you're not. Just trust your technique, trust your hand placement, trust the stuff that you're being coached to do, and then just perfect it and just keep going in. And then, and then at the end of the day, just be mean. Just be a mean SOB and go out there and hurt people and you'll be okay. I asked you about the wide receiver and you went back to offensive Absolutely. line again. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> So tell me about Trey Palmer and, and, I mean, just how special he is. I mean, he's so fluid. I mean, when you look at receivers, the number one thing that I look at them is, like, the fluidity in their routes, you know? And we talked about it last year with Samori Toure, right? Like, just how he didn't seem like he was that fast. Now, granted, he ran really fast to the combine, you know, but he didn't seem like he was a blaze or anything, but he just created separation because of efficiency in his movement. Same thing with Trey Palmer. I think Trey Palmer is a little more gifted physically than even Samori was last year. But he's efficient in his movements. He's efficient in his releases off the ball. And then he has phenomenal ball skills where if you throw him a 50-50 ball, like he's going to be able to go high point it and make the contested catch. And then he, if he gets separation, he's got the speed to keep that separation. You know, So every aspect of his game is really, really impressive. You know, even you see him in there, and he's not the best at it, but he'll put his head in there and block. He'll get in there, and he'll drive people, and he'll get after it, which is all you want from a receiver, right? Just just try. Just try. You know, that, that was the biggest thing. Like, just give it effort, and he does. He gives great effort, which Mickey Joseph would demand out of those guys, I have no doubt. So, you know, he all the aspects of his game are starting to come together in a big way, and he's a guy that if you can just hold on for a little bit and they don't bracket coverage him, he's going to get open. 
And so that's why I say just two and a half seconds, three seconds. Like, that's all it's going to take for a guy like Trey Palmer to get open. And then when they decide to start bracket coveraging him and doubling him, Marcus Washington, Alante Oliver Brown, all Martin. these other dudes, Oliver Martin, will be open because they can win their one-on-one -on -one matchups too. That's what I do appreciate about Trey Palmer. And you've had, you've gone on your spills about wide receivers on this and that, you know, they want theirs and all of that. But Trey Palmer wants to win more than anything. I mean, he is... He wants this team to win so badly at the core of all of it that he doesn't care if he gets all of the touchdowns. Yeah, of course, he wants to score because that's a playmaker. He wants the ball in his hands, but ultimately, he just wants this team to find ways to win. And those are the best kinds of receivers. You know, I think of like the, the elites in the NFL, you know, the guys that eventually get to the point where they're throwing hissy fits because they're not getting the ball. Well, probably because you're not playing at the same level you were earlier. You know, I think of a guy like Stephon Diggs. He would, you couldn't see him happier than for a guy like Gabe Davis yesterday, right? Dude had two touchdowns. It was crazy. And Diggs was the first one down there congratulating. He wasn't in the corner pouting like, oh, I didn't get the ball because they're winning. Yeah. You know, you think about guys like Adam Thielen, who was the great receiver for the Vikings, and now they have Justin Jefferson. He knows he's in a supportive role, and he's still there being excited. Like, the guys that want to win and help the team are the best wide receivers I've ever been because around. Because those elite wide receivers, when teams have to start game planning around them, they know that that's what opens up things for other people and allows the offense to really open up the play. Book. All right, so moving forward to Purdue now and getting an extra day. Got a one less day last week, but getting an extra day to recover and prepare this week. What have you seen out of Purdue? The quick passing game. You know, they did it to us last year. They're staying a lot. I mean, O'Connell, when he's healthy, is dealing and wheeling really well right now. You know, they do a great job of, even though it's a quick passing game, they manage the game really well as far as time of possession. Um, the defense, too, has been surprising. You, know, you lose a guy like George Karloftis last year who goes in the first round, and they've really kind of picked up the slack with him. You know, they don't have the emerging number one draft pick on the edge, but they've been able to create constant pressure um, defensively. Uh, this is a game where, in my opinion, you're going to want to control the clock, and we're going to have to score more than 14 points. You know, I think Purdue has done a really nice job of scoring this year. You know, this is going to be one of those games that you've got to get to 30 points, I think, and I think we're very capable of it. But at the same time, that's going to be very dependent on the defense of getting off the field on third down. This team loves to live in third and five and short. You know, they do a good job on first and second down, whether it's a quick slant, quick hitch, getting themselves in third and manageable and then converting. You know, so this is something we got to get off the field on third down and we got to win on first down and keep them behind the sticks. I can't believe I didn't even ask you, how about the hit from Anthony Grant? Oh my gosh, that dude is dead. <laughs> I, 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 I thought that that dude, like, I was like, dude, they're gonna have to peel this dude off the turf. He is such a physical finisher. You know, you talk about finishing runs, like that's the clip you put up. Like you finish the run, you finish it. And I love that out of him. You know, he reminds me a little bit, you know, people might freak out here, but like how Zeke Elliott finished in college is kind of how he likes to finish in college. He doesn't shy away from contact. He initiates the contact. He loves the physicality. Loves it. He grows off of it, too. You see it as he gets stronger from going into the first quarter to the fourth quarter. It's like the hits just charge him up, and then he just unleashes there towards the end of the game. I wish people could have seen how the defense reacted to that oh, that's on the, the sideline. Like, they went nuts. The, the, reaction, the reactions to those type of hits are the best. Like, I, I'll never forget, we were, we were on the flip side of it. Le'Veon Bell... We're playing in Michigan State 2012, and Le'Veon Bell absolutely runs clean through P.J. Smith. Like, one of the hardest hits in person I've ever seen, and the whole sideline just like, boom! Like, <laughs> the reactions to those type of hits are the best things ever. It fired up the defense, I gotta say. But that's what Anthony Grant does, because mm -hmm. he can, yes, make some... Uh, cuts and be oh, a lead jump, and get away but king. then he also will run over yeah. people he's and the does jump not cut care. King. I love his little jump cut things where he's just bouncing around and then that's what things people think he's going to jump cut and then right through their teeth he comes. You just don't find running backs that do both like that. No, when you have a special back like that, you hold on to him. I mean, I, I'm hearing from scouts, he's climbing boards on the NFL side, he's starting to get noticed more. I mean, when you're top three, top five in the Big Ten in rushing, you're going to get noticed. But I brought him up, that's what made me think of it, is that um, they got to be able to run the ball better, too, because, you know, as well as they've been running it and he's been running it, it was a more of a struggle last week or on Friday against Rutgers. You have to run the ball in this league, especially the later in the season you get. You know, the bad weather games, the wet ball drill, all those things you got to rely on your run game. Look at how Michigan beat Ohio State last year, right? Pouring snow, bad weather field was crappy and they just grinded it out on the ground and Ohio State's known for throwing the ball over the yard and doing their thing and they got out physical you know if you can out physical teams you're going to win a lot of football games but that goes back to the offensive line having the mentality of 
I'm going to out physical anyone who gets put in front of me because it's the offensive line and the, the tight ends that lead that running back. Now, he can make special things happen, but there's an added confidence to you as an offensive lineman when you know you have a guy behind you that can take it the distance with just a tiny little hole, you know? So I hope that offensive line realizes you got something really special back there. Like, don't waste it. Don't waste these opportunities. Every run play is a great opportunity to go out there and give your offensive coordinator even more confidence to run the football. Did you play at Purdue? I did. How is it? Awful. <laughs> Stadium is just trash. I mean, it's so bad. I mean, you get also the other thing that sucks is like the field is so bad. Guys get hurt. And I, I'm being dead serious. I mean, Spencer Long tore his MCL there my senior year. You had, um, oh gosh, the morning per personnel. Surely they've replaced like, the turf since then. I highly doubt it. I, I highly doubt it. And it's like ankle high. You'll see. It's ankle high. It's not fun. And I mean, it's not a good stadium. Mm. The locker room, I think, is like a temporary building. Yeah. Like, it's just not a, it's not a cool stadium. Night game and uh, Purdue coming off a win, and they've well, a couple wins now in a row that I'm sure this fan base is pretty fired up about. Yeah, we'll see. You doubted Rutgers, and it I was. I did doubt Rutgers, but Rutgers is not Purdue. I mean, <laughs> Purdue's gross. Sorry. It's just a gross place. So, I guess, give me the, the keys to victory for the Huskers. Yeah, offensively, you got to score 30. You know, I think that's this is an offense that can score, so we have to beat them to 30 points. Uh, we got to run the ball, control the clock, keep that offense off the field. You know, I want to see us have probably 35 to 37 minutes of possession, um, which would be really big on offense. And then on defense, you got to win on first down. You got to keep them behind the sticks, keep them in second and 10, and then get off the field on third down. You know, those, those two things go hand in hand of keeping them in third and long and winning on first down. But that's going to be really important. And then the last thing is going to be flipping the field position, which we've been good at this year. You know, our punter's been really good at pinning them deep. He struggled a little bit last he week. He, he was, was hurt. He was badly hurt. You know, he was hurt. He was hobbling around a little bit. But you've got to be able to flip the field and make Purdue go the long way. Which Timmy Bleak wrote as a backup, and he's been a good punter before, so we have depth at the punter position, <laughs> believe it or not. So Woo. we'll see uh, how, how Timmy does if Brian Buschini cannot go. So uh, players to watch. Um, you know, players to watch, I think, just continue to watch this rotation at offensive line. You know, who starts at right tackle? Is it Ben Hart or is it Anthony? You know, who starts at right guard? Is it um, Henry Lutovsky? Is it Ethan Piper? And, you know, is Brock Bando still going to start? You know, there's so many moving pieces of are we starting to see a final five? You know, I think that's something to watch on offense. On, on defense, you know, we got to watch the edge guys. O'Shawn Mathis was able to get his column in the sack, or sack in the column again this last week. Caleb Tanner, like those type of guys need to show up in this game and not get frustrated. This is a really frustrating team to pass rush against because you feel like you take two steps and the ball's gone. Take two steps and this, you can kind of get in this rhythm and all of a sudden it's third and five and they're taking a deep shot and he's holding it and you're thinking, oh shoot, it's a rhythm pass and you don't, maybe don't have your best move and then you kind of get caught flat-footed. You know, just making sure that those Garrett Nelson, Caleb Tanner, and O'Shawn Mathis are able to just keep pushing and just trusting the system, trusting their ability, and eventually it'll get home. Okay, so I guess diving into that a little bit more, the key matchup that the Huskers have to win. Ooh, it's going to be these receivers, uh, Purdue's receivers versus our DBs. You know, I think that Rutgers at times was running by us, and at times like there was opportunities. Now Rutgers' quarterback situation is less than ideal. Um, you know, I think Purdue's got a much better quarterback. So these DBs against this quick, how do you stop a quick passing game? You get up in their face and make that quarterback hold it a little bit longer, disrupt the timing, and then those pass rushers can get home. You know, so big matchups going to be Purdue wide receivers versus this back end for the black shirts. All right, great to see you in studio. Always good to be back home. You're back from hunting trips for a while. and Deer so. season's starting soon, don't worry. <laughs> well, take that pizza home to the kids. Oh, absolutely. Kids are going to crush some vows for dinner. Again, thanks to Vows for the pizza today and for, uh, as always, sponsoring this podcast, The Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cooty. Go Big Red. Yes, you got it in. And subscribe and like wherever you listen to, to never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years.